Hello everyone, my name is Hannah and I'm a PhD candidate at Queen's University in Canada. I'm so thrilled to be part of this conference with so many excellent scholars and exciting presentations, um, particularly as we meet virtually at the University of Birmingham, which is where I did my undergraduate degree. Um, I can't wait for our discussions on the 9th of September, but please feel free to email me anytime before or after then if you have any questions uh, or want to discuss anything with me. Um, before we get going, um, I would like to first acknowledge that Queen's University, which is where I'm based, is situated on Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory. I'm grateful to live and learn as an uninvited guest on these lands. I also want to acknowledge the too often unrecognised debt that more than human scholarship has to Indigenous ontologies. This has been noted by scholars like Kim Tolbert, Billy Ray Belcourt and Zoe Todd. Um, this is not just an issue that is relevant for those of us residing in settler colonial states um, and I would like to encourage all of us to consider how our more than human scholarship might become anti-colonial. Today I would like to share with you some sounds and stories of ivory bill woodpeckers in this presentation entitled Sounding Ivory Bill Woodpeckers Back to Life, Listening to Historical Bird Sound Recordings in an Age of Extinction. This work forms part of my PhD research, which is funded by a Social Science and Research Council of Canada, Vanier Scholarship. So, there's just a little disclaimer. The ivory bill woodpecker, or ivory bell for short, is, or perhaps was, a large woodpecker found in the hardwood forests of the southeastern USA and Cuba, which has dipped in and out of presumed extinction since the 19th century. The ivory bill is an incredibly charismatic and well-loved bird species, known to birders as the Lord God bird or Holy Grail bird, due to its impressive stature, striking plumage, loud drumming and incredible rarity. Though the bird was never particularly common, it was all but decimated in the US due to post-Civil War rapid industrial deforestation, as well as mass culling by natural history collectors. Um, you can see an example of that here in the bottom right, which is in Harvard's Comparative Museum of Zoology, um, who have over 60 skins of ivory bills in their collection. The last universally accepted sighting in the US was in 1944. However, there remain legions of so-called ivory bill hunters who trail the swamplands in the deep south in the hope of capturing tangible evidence that this bird is not actually yet extinct. Though such efforts have been compared to Sasquatch or Loch Ness monster searches, the group implicated here are not your average cryptozoologists or conspiracy theorists. Many are respected ornithologists who stake their credibility on the line for a chance to be the ones who rediscover the species. Despite decades of searches and several alleged rediscoveries, however, no conclusive evidence of this bird in the USA have been produced for almost a century. And yet, the searches continue. The ivory bill is, according to searcher Tim Gallagher, a hard bird to give up on. It is difficult to say exactly why the ivory bill, and not the passenger pigeon or the great orc or any other recently or presumed extinct bird species, is at the centre of all of this. Perhaps it is a desperate attempt to cling on to a symbol of pioneer America, or the fact that it has been rescued from extinction before. Or perhaps, as I will argue in this presentation, it is the unique and lively afterlives of the ivory bill that have suspended it in this state between life and death hypnotising birders into the belief that this much-loved lost bird could be found. The particular afterlives that I would like to dis discuss here are a series of sound recordings of an ivory bill nest taken in 1935. What does it mean to have a sound recording of a lost species? The fact that there are sound recordings of ivory bills is actually quite unique, as there are not many sound recordings of presumed extinct species. At the turn of the 20th century, however, two historical moments coalesced. The first, the advent of portable sound recording technologies, and the second, the realisation of the rapid decline of American birds. The ivory bill recordings were captured in Louisiana in 1935 by a joint team from Cornell University and the American Museum of Natural History as part of a tour across America to record America's vanishing birds before it was too late. 
These are some of the first sound recordings of wild birds to ever be taken, and the ivory bill recordings are the only universally accepted sound recordings of this species. The Cornell Lab of Ornithology's Macaulay Library made these sounds freely available online as part of their large-scale digitization effort in the early 2000s, and now anyone with an internet connection can listen to the crackly, spliced together calls of these ghost birds, um, and I will play some of that to you now. funky sounding birds huh? Um, so it's my argument here that these sound recordings are not just representations of ivory bills but performative tools of their resurrection. As in, these historical recordings bring the ivory bill woodpecker back to life. In one sense I mean this metaphorically. In comparison to other kinds of afterlives such as photographs or taxidermy mounts, sound recordings have the potential to forge more empathetic, lively relationships with extinct animals. In this way they can help to amend some of the issues identified in animal studies about the difficulties of knowing historical animals. In part this is due to the affordances of sound itself. Sound study scholars have drawn attention to the intensely transformative powers of sound. It is a relational embodied event that can transform relationships between bodies, both human and non-human. As well, sound recordings are a very particular kind of animal afterlife. As opposed to other relatively fixed mediums, sound recordings are not really sounds, but data stored on reels, hard drives, or code that, on the press of the play button, is brought to life. As argued by Michael Gallagher, upon playback there is a paradoxical spatiality of sound recordings, as listeners are vibrating with both acoustic traces of the past and an assemblement of machines here in the present. In this sense, Gallagher argues, sound recordings are both representative and performative. Though the data that informs the sound is from a distant time and place, the experience of listening is unavoidably and unmistakably here and now. Marrying this with the intimate effects of sound, the experience of listening to extinct beings is dizzying. It collapses time and space, subject and object, even life and death, sub and thus seems to disturb the finality of extinction. If we can hear ivory bills, can they really be gone? Indeed, it is worth seriously questioning whether, without this sonic afterlife, and without it being freely available online, so many people would cast doubt on the ivory bell's extinction. In another sense, these sound recordings have the potential to resurrect ivory bill woodpeckers more literally. This is because ivory bill hunters have adopted the 1935 recordings as tools and benchmarks in their searches. The most striking example of this is in a field technique called playback, wherein searchers play the 1935 recordings from speakers in forests in the hope that surviving birds will respond. Many searchers have reported hearing alleged ivory bills respond to these playbacks, which, if true, is a fascinating case of intergenerational communication. Other searchers, though, find such playback techniques to be controversial either because they're more likely to scare, uh, scare surviving ivory bells away, or because the decoy sounds could be picked up by searchers who could mistake them for actual ivory bells. Even when playback is not used though, the recordings play a key role in training volunteers and machine learning algorithms to identify ivory bells in the field, as well as in scrutinizing new potential ivory bell recordings. You can see that here in Jeffrey Hill's comparison between a spectrogram of a recording he took in 2006 next to a spectrogram of the 1935 recording. A match with the 1935 recordings would give a strong suggestion that ivory bills are present in the area, but even a perfectly matched sound would likely never be accepted as definitive proof that the ivory bill is not extinct. Recordings can be faked, sounds can be mimicked by or mistaken for humans or other birds, and, as previously mentioned, recordists may inadvertently capture other searchers' playback efforts. 
Still, putative ivory bill recordings can help to locate the bird for a better chance of a photograph, or even better, a video, that could prove the existence of the bird. In these practices, the 1935 recordings proved to not just be an afterlife of the ivory bill, but a lively and mobile tool that has the potential to communicate with and prove the existence of surviving ivory bills. In all of these ways, this sonic afterlife is not a representation with which to mourn the past, but a performative tool that brings the past back to life, both in feeling and, if you believe the accounts of ivory bill rediscoverers, in fact. However, I must note, as with every representation of animals, these sound recordings are not neutral. In the first instance, there have been various layers of framing, mediation and editing of this sound recording. There were, and still are, very particular cultures of bird sound recording, informed by technologies, institutions and recorder biases. In the 1930s, bird sound recording was concerned with focusing in on particular species and extracting the sounds from its context. The bird sound would be framed through technologies like the parabolic reflector, pictured here, and editing after the fact discarded clips that included human or environmental intrusions. Accounts from the Ivory Bell Expedition in 1935 reported that these birds seemed to be making sounds in response to the recordist's presence, including when the men shake trees holding ivory bells in order to elicit a response. Yet these interventions are not audible in the digital recording. For the purposes of playback, ivory bell hunters have attempted to augment the recordings even further by bringing the background back to digital black, as well as lengthening the time between ivory bill calls so that live bird responses would be audible to volunteers. Clearly, these editing decisions make the recording that's available online sound quite different from the reel-to-reel -reel tape, which itself is quite different from the actual sonic encounter from which the voice was taken. I do not intend to over romanticize the original sound, but rather to point to the strangeness of such a heavily mediated, edited and specific recording becoming the sonic ambassador for the entire ivory bell species. This is stranger still given the distinct individual differences within species over time and space. An ivory bill in Arkansas in 2006 is unlikely to sound the same as an ivory bill in Louisiana in 1935. Another reason that we might problematize the role of these historical recordings in both remembering and resurrecting the ivory bill is due to the culture surrounding its collection. It is worth returning more critically to a fact I mentioned earlier, which is that the ivory bills were recorded as, as part of an America-wide tour to record the country's vanishing birds before it was too late. This rings eerily similar to what is known as salvage ethnography, the frantic efforts of European settlers to record the songs, languages and customs of indigenous groups before they were lost, or more accurately, violently eradicated. I do not intend to argue that the practices of salvage ethnography against indigenous peoples is the same as the salvage recording of critically endangered birds, but rather to point to how these processes were similarly driven by a culture of collection and display. These efforts both relied on an, on an idea that preserving vanishing voices before the apparently unstoppable force of Euro European colonial modernization wiped them out, and then cataloguing these in elite institutions, was somehow a benevolent act. It is important to situate the salvage recording of birds in this broader history in order to recognise the colonial cultures that simultaneously caused the ivory bill woodpecker's demise and made this recording possible, thus avoiding to laud it as an unproblematic saviour of the problems we find in making meaningful relationships with lost beings. Sound recordings can change everything about how extinction is storied and experienced. As I have explored, sound recordings are a very particular kind of afterlife, in that they are not just representative, but performative. Sound recordings thus hold immense power to influence our relationships with animals, including and especially how we might relate to lost beings. However, it is imperative to approach these recordings critically and carefully, paying attention to the cultures and technologies that created them. Though the ivory bill is an early example, this case has implications for all beings that have been or will be lost after the advent of recording technologies. 
Such sounds can be found on websites like the Macaulay Library, Zeno Canto, and the British Library Wildlife Archive, which hold hundreds of thousands of historical and modern animal sound recordings. I hope and predict that such animal afterlives will become more and more central to how we experience and story animal extinction. Here are some references. Thank you so much for listening to my presentation. I hope that the sounds and stories of ivory bills resonated with some of you and I can't wait for our discussions in September.